Hi folks! The following video is going to discuss new types of substitution and elimination mechanisms known as SND1 and E1. Recall that SN2 reactions are going to require a strong nucleophile and an accessible alpha carbon of your alkyl halide. Also recall that E2 elimination mechanisms require use of a strong base and the beta hydrogen needs to adopt an antiperiplanar orientation relative to the leaving group. Today's video is going to consider what happens if you have a weak base and or a weak nucleophile instead of a strong one. Let's consider the following tertiary alkyl bromide, and we're dissolving this in ethanol solvent. Two products are observed. In one of them, the substitution product, the bromine has been replaced by the O and the ethyl group of the solvent, but the oxygen has lost its proton. And also an elimination product, an alkene, is also observed. The observed rate law is that the rate equals the rate constant times the concentration of alkyl halide. We would call this a unimolecular rate law because it only depends on one molecule rather than two. Because it's unimolecular rather than bimolecular, our mechanism for this reaction can't be either SN2 or E2. Instead, we'll need a new mechanism to explain this reactivity. Here I've just copied that same reaction equation from before for reference, and below I'm going to be showing you the SN1 and E1 mechanisms to get to the substitution and elimination products. The substitution mechanism is going to begin with a loss of leaving group step. I would show this with one curved arrow, taking the electrons from the carbon-bromine bond and bringing them to bromine. This forms a carbocation and the bromide anion. The carbocation is a really good electrophile, and it can react with a nucleophile. The nucleophile that we have around is the ethanol solvent. The oxygen of this is nucleophilic. I'll have a nucleophilic attack step, which involves one curved arrow. I take an oxygen lone pair and bring it to the carbocation to form a new oxygen-carbon bond. In the resulting intermediate, the oxygen has three bonds and a positive charge. Notice that my current intermediate is getting pretty close to my final substitution product. I just need to get rid of that proton from oxygen. What I can do is bring in another ethanol molecule. There is plenty of it around because it's the solvent, and I'm going to use ethanol as a base in a proton transfer step. I take a lone pair from ethanol and bring it to the proton, I take the electrons from the OH bond and bring them to oxygen. This proton transfer step forms my neutral substitution product, and it forms an equivalent of the conjugate acid of ethanol. This type of reaction, in which a solvent molecule behaves as the nucleophile, can be known as a solvolysis reaction. The first step of the mechanism the carbocation formation, due to loss of leaving group, is the slow step. And notice that only the alkyl halide is involved in this step. The name SN1 stands for a substitution reaction occurring by a nucleophilic mechanism that is unimolecular, only involving the alkyl halide in this case, in the slow step. The first step of the E1 mechanism is the same, involving a loss of leaving group from the alkyl halide. I would take the electrons from the carbon-bromine bond and bring them to bromine. 
This would form the same carbocation and bromide anion. In the E1 mechanism, my second step is going to involve the ethanol solvent, but instead of a nucleophilic attack, the ethanol is going to act as a base in this step. You'll want to draw out a carbon-hydrogen bond that is beta to the carbocation, and we're going to show the deprotonation of this CH bond. I'd take a lone pair from my ethanol base and bring it to that proton, then take the electrons from the carbon-hydrogen bond and bring them to the middle of the nearby carbon-carbon bond, and this is showing formation of a pi bond. This step gives the alkene product and an equivalent of the conjugate acid of the ethanol solvent. Here as well, it is the first reaction step that involves loss of leaving group that is the slowest step. And so this slowest step is unimolecular, only involving the alkyl halide. The name E1 stands for an elimination reaction that is unimolecular at its slowest step. I want to show you what a reaction coordinate diagram would look like for the SN1 and E1 mechanisms. You're starting out with your alkyl halide. The first step of the mechanism is a loss of leaving group, and this has a very high barrier, going to the carbocation and bromide anion. After this carbocation has formed, I'm going to draw the rest of this mechanism for the SN1 pathway in blue. There's a smaller barrier for the nucleophilic attack of the solvent molecule ethanol at the carbocation to form this cationic molecule. Then there's one final barrier, which I'm drawing as relatively low, going from this cationic intermediate to my neutral substitution product. In the same diagram, I'm going to show the pathway going from the carbocation to the E1 product, an alkene. From the carbocation intermediate, there is a single barrier between the carbocation and the final alkene product. One thing I want you to notice about how I've drawn this diagram is that I've put the energy level for the carbocation and bromide as higher in energy than the alkyl bromide starting material. This is because the carbocation is unstable, meaning higher in energy due to its incomplete octet. I intentionally made the first barrier of my mechanism, the highest one, and I could call this my rate determining step. It takes the most energy for the whole reaction to take your neutral starting material and make that carbocation. I'm also being really deliberate in making my product energies lower in energy than my starting material. I do this because I want to show that my reaction is exergonic, meaning that it's spontaneous and favorable. I know that this is the case because this reaction occurs and forms these products, so they must be lower in energy than the starting material, or else the reaction simply wouldn't happen. Another thing I want you to notice is that my mechanism for substitution and elimination starts out the same with the loss of leaving group and carbocation formation. And the final thing on this diagram that I want to draw your attention to is the fact that from the carbocation, the barrier going to the substitution product is lower in energy than the barrier going to the elimination product. It's only slightly different in energy, so that is why we observe both products. One thing you'll need to be on the lookout for in SN1 and E1 mechanisms is carbocation rearrangement. If a carbocation forms, which it does in these mechanisms, 
it can rearrange if it would generate a more stable carbocation. Let's consider the following more complicated alkyl halide. I'm imagining reacting this molecule with methanol solvent. The product you may initially expect would be the one where the OCH3 group of the methanol has replaced the chloride leaving group for an SN1 type of a reaction. And this product is observed. But there are two other products that you also see, where you have the OCH3 on a middle carbon or the carbon on the far left. When you see these types of mixtures of products, that is a sign that carbocation rearrangement has occurred. Let's consider our mechanism and how each of these three products is formed. An SN1 mechanism is always going to begin with a loss of leaving group. I break the carbon-chlorine bond and bring those electrons to chlorine, the leaving group. After the chloride has left, I have a tertiary carbocation. Notice this carbon is attached to three other carbons. Tertiary carbocations are pretty stable, but a rearrangement will occur in this case. Where I take the carbon-carbon bond of a nearby methyl and move it over to the carbocation. After this rearrangement, I have a different tertiary carbocation, but notice that this one is adjacent to a pi bond. This indicates that I have the empty p orbital next to a pi bond type of resonance. To draw the other resonance contributor, I would move the electrons from the pi bond over a position. In the other resonance contributor, the carbocation has moved to the far left and the pi bond has moved as well. The reason a carbocation rearrangement occurred is because it formed a resonance-stabilized carbocation, which is more stable than just a tertiary carbocation by itself. So, we have three different carbons that have positive charge or partial positive character, and each of these carbons is electrophilic and could be attacked by a nucleophilic methanol solvent molecule. I'm going to start by showing the mechanism for the tertiary carbocation drawn furthest to the left. In this nucleophilic attack, I would take a lone pair from oxygen and bring it to the carbocation. My intermediate would have a new carbon-oxygen bond, and the oxygen has three bonds and a positive charge. To get to a neutral product, I'm going to bring in a methanol solvent molecule to act as a base in a proton transfer step. I'd take a lone pair from oxygen, bring it to the proton, take the electrons from the OH bond, and bring them to oxygen. This gets me to a neutral product, where I have an ether present in my molecule, and notice that this product is the same one that I drew as the first product formed, up above. Now we're going to consider nucleophilic attack using our ethanol solvent and attacking our other carbocation. I would take a lone pair from oxygen and bring it to the carbocation. After this step, I have a new carbon-oxygen bond, and the oxygen has a positive charge. To get to a neutral final product, I will bring in a methanol solvent molecule to act as a base in a proton transfer step. I would take the lone pair electrons from my base, bring them to the proton, break the OH bond, bring those electrons to oxygen. This proton transfer gets me to a neutral final product. And notice that this product that I've drawn is the same as the second one that I had drawn up on the top of the page. 
We have one final carbocation to think about, the one drawn furthest on the right, and I need to consider what if a methanol solvent molecule nucleophilically attacked that carbocation. After the nucleophilic attack, I have a new carbon-oxygen bond toward the left of the molecule, and the oxygen has a formal plus one charge. To get to a neutral final product, I'll bring in methanol as a base to deprotonate this molecule. I take a lone pair from the methanol solvent, bring it to hydrogen, break the OH bond, and bring those electrons to oxygen. This proton transfer forms my neutral final product, and this is the same structure that I had drawn on the top equation as well. So what has happened in this mechanism? I started with a loss of leaving group and formed a carbocation. I had a carbocation rearrangement step that formed a new carbocation that was resonance stabilized. For each carbocation drawn, I had to consider nucleophilic attack, then proton transfer to get to a final substitution product. Whenever we're thinking about SN1 or E1 mechanisms, be on the lookout for potential carbocation rearrangements. With the mechanisms for SN1 and E1 in mind, I want to discuss solvent effects on the reaction rate. Recall that the rate is equal to a rate constant times the concentration of alkyl halide. And the rate determining step, the slowest step of the whole reaction, is the formation of the carbocation and the halide anion. To make an SN1 or E1 reaction faster, you want to make the carbocation and the halide as stable as possible. Polar protic solvents, featuring polar OH or NH bonds, will stabilize both the carbocation and the halide. Let's imagine ethanol as an example of a polar protic solvent. The halide anion can be stabilized by hydrogen bonding with the OH groups of ethanol. The halide has negative charge, so the hydrogens with partial positive charge from the OH bonds will be attracted to this negative charge. So the polar protic solvent is interacting with this halide anion. The carbocation is also stabilized by this polar solvent. The carbocation has positive charge, and the oxygen ends of the molecule, where you have electron density and partial negative charge, are going to be attracted to the carbocation. These attractive interactions are stabilizing the carbocation. Let's imagine we have an E1 mechanism in a polar aprotic solvent. The carbocation and halide formed are higher in energy than the alkyl halide starting material, and the slowest step of the mechanism is the carbocation formation. Now let's imagine having a polar protic solvent. The biggest effect that this is going to have is it's going to lower the energy of the carbocation and anion due to these solvent interactions that I drew out. When you lower the energy of this intermediate, you lower the energy of the highest barrier leading to it. As you lower the barrier, the reaction gets faster. Because the polar protic solvent stabilizes the carbocation and halide intermediates, it increases the rate of the SN1 and E1 reactions. Now I want to consider how the identity of the leaving group in an SN1 or E1 reaction affects its rate. A good leaving group is going to be a stable base, and stable bases are conjugate bases from strong acids. The more stable the base you form, 
in your loss of leaving group, the better the leaving group it is. And the better the leaving group, the faster the SN1 or E1 reactions will occur. Let's consider the following alkyl halides. In each case, I have a tertiary carbon attached to the halogen. What's observed is that the alkyl fluoride undergoes really slow SN1 and E1 reactions, and the rate increases where the alkyl iodide has the fastest SN1 and E1 rate. We can explain this trend by looking at the leaving groups in their anionic form after they've detached from carbon. Fluoride is the strongest base because it's the smallest, and iodide is the weakest base because it's the largest. This would be a size effect. Because fluoride is a strong base by itself, it is a terrible leaving group, and because iodide is a weak and very stable base by itself, it is a great leaving group. We also need to consider the carbocation stability when considering rates for SN1 and E1 reactions. Methyl carbocations, where the carbon only has three hydrogens attached to them, are the least stable, followed by primary carbocations, secondary ones, and then tertiary ones. Even more stable than tertiary carbocations or resonance-stabilized carbocations. If you have a carbocation adjacent to an alkene, it's known as an allylic carbocation. And if the carbocation is adjacent to this aromatic ring, it's known as a benzylic carbocation. The methyl primary and secondary carbocations are too unstable and they will not form in SN1 or E1 mechanisms involving alkyl halides. But the tertiary carbocation and the allylic and benzylic carbocations that are stabilized by resonance are all stable enough that they will form in SN1 and E1 mechanisms involving alkyl halides. We have to pay attention to stereochemistry in the case of SN1 substitution reactions. Here's an example of a chiral alkyl halide starting material, and this is reacting with water solvent, a weak base and weak nucleophile, because it's neutral. If you assigned the RS stereochemistry of this chiral center, it is S. There are two different stereoisomers of product that are formed. In one of them, the OH group is in the same spot as the original bromine, and the molecule has S configuration. And in the other case, the OH group could be drawn as on the bottom of the molecule, and this drawing has R configuration instead. These two products form in nearly equal amounts, and when we have 50% each of two enantiomers, you have what's known as a racemic mixture. This mixture would not be optically active, and therefore would not rotate plane polarized light, even though it's a sample made up of chiral compounds. To see why we get this mixture of enantiomers, consider the mechanism for SN1. The mechanism begins with the loss of leaving group. After the loss of leaving group, a carbocation is formed. The carbon of the carbocation is sp2 hybridized, and therefore it is trigonal planar. It has an empty p orbital with lobes above and below the plane of the molecule. Now that our molecule is flat, we have to consider where the nucleophile could attack. 
One possibility is that the nucleophile donates its electron density into this particular lobe of the p orbital that is above the plane of the molecule. This would form a new carbon-oxygen bond pointing up in the page. This intermediate, which leads to the following product up above, has S-stereochemistry. It's also possible, because our carbocation is flat, the water nucleophile could come in to the bottom lobe of the empty p orbital instead. If this occurred, the new carbon-oxygen bond would be pointing down on the page. This intermediate, which leads to the R product shown up above, in the intermediate as well, I now have R stereochemistry. The reason I get a mixture of S and R products is because the carbocation was planar and it was not chiral, and the empty p orbital is equal in size above and below the molecule, and the two lobes are equally likely to be attacked by the nucleophile. When drawing your products for SN1 and E1, you have to be careful to draw all possible stereoisomers. Consider the following alkyl halide. Notice that the carbon-chlorine bond is at the benzylic position relative to this aromatic ring. I'm reacting this alkyl chloride with a methanol solvent. The first thing you want to do is imagine your loss of leaving group and what carbocation is formed. This reaction would form a tertiary and benzylic carbocation as well as a chloride anion. From this carbocation, we'll have to consider what substitution products could form and then what elimination products could form. This carbocation is planar, and the nucleophilic methanol solvent could attack this carbocation from above or below. If the methanol attacks from below, the OCH3 group in the product is a dash, and the methyl group could be drawn as a wedge. If instead the methanol had attacked from above the carbocation, the carbon OCH3 bond would be a wedge, and you could draw the methyl group as a dash. These are the two stereoisomers of SN1 products that are formed. To predict the E1 elimination products, we have to consider all of the beta positions and whether they have any hydrogens on them that could be deprotonated. I could deprotonate the methyl beta position. I could deprotonate the CH2 group, but this beta carbon does not have any hydrogens on it. So it is not possible to do an elimination to this carbon. If you deprotonated a carbon-hydrogen bond from the methyl substituent, you would form the following alkene product. If instead you deprotonated the CH2 group of the ethyl, there are two possible products that could form. One of them has the methyl group pointing up and away from the phenyl ring, and the other stereoisomer of product has the methyl group pointing down. I could classify these products as E and Z configurations. All three of these alkenes would form, and I would call the three of them together my E1 products. So this was an example where I had to consider the stereochemistry of the substitution product as well as the stereochemistry of the alkene E1 products. All right. So in this video, I introduced the SN1 and E1 mechanisms. These both involve the slow step of the reaction being carbocation formation. I talked about how carbocation rearrangements could affect the products that you form in these reactions. I talked about features that influence the rate of these substitution and elimination reactions. 
and I also talked about stereochemical outcomes. That's it for this video. I will see you in class.